She wouldn't lay a nectarine on a chopping board to save your life. She wouldn't dye her hair or play a harpsichord to save your life or pull a sink plug out or open up her eyes to save your life. Admit that she did wrong or just apologise to save your life. But still you'd pull a million pints or pallets or scrub rotten mud off an entire amphitheatre with a broken cotton bud so she could sit and spend each afternoon unclogging the messiest brain box in North London with a world-class psychotherapist. People tell you, just get over it. Move on. Forget her. There's plenty more eggs in the frying pan of spilt milk, etc, etc. Except there's not. Since all around are moralists making a dire noise who bore you deeper than a bishop bores a bunch of choir boys. Everywhere you look, there struts a virtue-signalling tosser who'll snap their throat to prove their opinions are the correctest ones possible. Though every person that you meet has only two opinions. I'm not racist and I am a beacon of ethical brilliance. Some try to convince you that threats of domestic violence made by women should never be taken seriously, no matter how big or how brimming with psychotic rage a girl is. While threats of retaliation made in self-defence by men are a vile abomination. So it's your fault the relationship ended. You're the one who destroyed it. And you should apologise to her and flush your pride down the toilet. With sledgehammers of decency, these liberal usual suspects pound your heart to pulp and smash your gasping mind to dust specks. With daggers of integrity and swords of glowing virtue, they stab you in the stomach with a smile as they besmirch you. But liberals are so good, so right, so modern and so clever. By God, they're so much cleverer, more modern, writer, better. So fair and open-minded, their moralities are premium. What worthless, low-down pond life one must be to disagree with them. To disagree that children's corpses littered round a concert hall by a creed that kills for sport, that wants its virgins, wants it all, is just the price we have to pay. And golly, isn't it worth it to have our wonderful, diverse, free, open, vibrant surfeit of multicultural loveliness is worth it so a Western progressive bourgeoisie that never asks or answers questions can flaunt its orthodoxy at a tofu dinner party to all its friends in the honky-hating bourgeois wankerati. A herd of classist, oikophobic, veritophobic robots shrugging off 10,000 Islamists with treasonous so what's. A flock of preening, poison-spitting narcissists who tell you it's noble to get on your knees and grovel. In a deluge of intellectual flatulence, declaring it a felony to stand up for yourself, your folk, your tribe's collective memory. Demanding you feel guilt for having self-respect and dignity. For being a work of nature being a man with masculinity. You hear the gang of judges sizzling in their vapid power. Without a map, your bumpy way gets bumpier by the hour. The mob are weaving forth, they're loading all their shrieking howitzers. They sermonise and slander you into a den of counsellors. They catapult their boulders of debilitating dogma and batter down your barricade. You gallop to a doctor. Who else is there? Your father's shuffled through this sieve of fishiness. Was he a father ever, or just half a sexual synthesis? 
your soul now crushed and sunken from these ever more diffusing I'm better than you, beta males and gamma females oozing from every nook and lecture hall across the sterile promontory, regurgitating all their shining, spoon-fed social commentary, crushed and sunken from society's creative people, possessing the imagination of a blind dung beetle, you drift and drift away from this macchiato-stirring virus and shove a different quintessential dust into your sinus. You can only face the world through the kaleidoscopic prism of ketamine, the only thing that beats a constant rhythm, the only method of forgiving those who cannot fathom an alienated misfit staring down into a chasm. Ravers smack, horse candy, donkey wonky fire, ketamine, Portal through the universe you couldn't squeeze an atom in. Escape route from the crudely painted three-dimensioned backdrop. God reflected in a mirror on which joy is racked up. Powdered Buddhism, pineal threshold, magic lever, majestic psychonautic voyage through the throbbing ether. Heaven in a frying pan, subverted pony valium, white fun, snuff plus, revivifying interstellar galleon, gurgling, cruising, goggle-eyed, quick cure for kicking hungers, extra-human gangway, golden key to the humongous, lines of pleasure, psychic sherbet, nasal exorcism, centuries secret treasure, Transdimensional incision, special K, emotional morphine, sniffable nirvana, unicorn food, zen dust, paraphysical gymkhana, repositioner of time and space, the mind, the ego, ketamine. Still just a placebo. There's nothing more you want to say or hear. Now you've detached yourself. All you want to do is roll a banknote and dispatch yourself into a different universe from all of mankind's trivia. Snorting, snorting, as opinions all around get sniffier. Those banknotes, though, are running out. They cannot reproduce themselves. And bosses, colleagues, customers, they all can go and screw themselves. Every job that anybody, anywhere, does, ever, is a dreary sack of ostrich mucus. Jobs just slither from your apathetic grasp like remoulade-smeared lizards. Money. Is this really how a human's worth is measured? All you ever wanted was a ticket in the raffle of love. Instead, you sell your slumbering brain cells in a brothel. And now you have to stand in line and sign your name and wrestle with all the devils in the trenches of the antisocial. So how do you escape this life with such a colour-free hue? You run into the arms of mystic beatniks up a tree who throw their arms around the world from Zhang Jiagang to Aachen. Is this how mould will be scraped off, how skies will cease to darken? You squeeze into a squatted Georgian townhouse that's disfigured by scaffolding and dreadlocked spray can brandishing left-wingers. Among the filth you drift into your chalky-fingered coma. You're 30 now, but deep inside, your age is getting lower. You move into a nursery school, where stars of tissue paper dangle from the ceiling. The fruits of childish labour. The ketamine your kite-high haircut-skipping new friends pedal flows like the ketchup on your cod and chips. You boil a kettle and fill a plastic bin with shower gel to stay hygienic. And like some sort of Allen key and flashlight-wielding relic of when mankind stalked woolly mammoths through the prehistoric bogs of Doggerland, you creep through Bristol's dark, prosaic supermarket car parks, cracking dustbins open, searching for pasta, trifle, sandwiches and maybe some tinned sturgeon to feed your tribe. At this point, a cluster of middle-class feminists floats up, and tells you that you're privileged. A flock of sluts that soaks up the Tuscan sunshine. Lazy whores with tongues as sharp as grapefruit, 
who think they're on the brink of some great intellectual breakthrough, whose daddies paid their student fees and financed their addictions to leather bags and high-heeled shoes of myriad descriptions, whose lovers shower them with all they see in glistening adverts, who sit and quaff champagne until the seventh or the eighth hurts their quaffered heads, inform you that, unlike them, you are privileged because you have a penis. Even though this life is double-edged and in our brave postmodern world, all ideological spew aside, more homelessness, more pressure to succeed in life, more suicide, more workplace death, worse prison sentences, less child custody. These are the male privileges. From Mercia to Muscovy, discrimination is against the law. And yet, how funny. Companies hire men to do the same job for more money. 